Good afternoon. I'm Mike Okamura, president of the Little Tokyo Historical Society, and I welcome you to the Imagine Little Tokyo Short Story Contest virtual award ceremony. The eighth annual short story contest is a partnership between LTHS and Discover Nikkei, as Joy noted, and it's a project of the Japanese American National Museum. Discover Nikkei is a living repository of really interesting articles submitted by people of Japanese ancestry around the globe. So the articles are either in English, Japanese, Portuguese, or Spanish. So please visit their website at discovernikkei.org. This event is the second year we decided to be online. So we are truly grateful that so many of you have joined us today. The advantages of technology allowed some of you to tune in from other parts of the country and even in other countries. Now that we are gingerly and safely entering a post-pandemic world, we would like to have next year's contest awards ceremony back to in-person in Little Tokyo. But I think we'll need to consider a hybrid in-person and online program due to the success of this format. Now, I'd like to introduce our MC, the magnificent, and magical Mike Palma. Mike is always generous with his time as he's been a mainstay in Little Tokyo and with the Asian American community for many years. You might know Mike from Cold Tofu, the nation's first Asian American improv and comedy group founded 40 years ago, many congratulations, and is based in Little Tokyo. He is celebrating his 20th year with Cold Tofu when he started at 10 years of age and is currently the Associate Artistic Director. What's more, he's a professional photographer for the Academy of Motion Picture, Arts and Sciences, known as the Oscars, and Disney. He's also a well-known commercial photographer, trekking throughout the country and in Japan, trying to capture that perfect moment. So with that, let's get the show on the road. Take it away, Mike. Well, wow, thank you so much, Mike, for that introduction. Uh, probably not as deserved as you guys think, but I really appreciate being here. But thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you to all of our viewers who are uh, tuning in for this amazing celebration of writers throughout the country and, of course, abroad. So we're going to get started. Just wanted to say um, thank you again to everybody who's participated and for uh, tuning in today. So this past year, we've had to do a lot of imagining, you know, inside of our homes due to the pandemic, imagining our lives before the lockdown, and of course, imagining what life will be afterwards. So for this eighth annual Imagine Little Tokyo Short Story Contest, we actually had 99 entries from all over the world, from places like Edogawa City in Japan, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and of course, New York City and here in our own backyards of Los Angeles, California, vividly capturing the scenes of Little Tokyo and what this place means to us. For myself, um, yeah, I guess I was 10 years old when I started my journey uh, to Little Tokyo. Uh, again, that, that's all not true, but um, Little Tokyo has always been a, had a big place in my heart, definitely through the community, through Nisei Week through the involvement of my own fiance, Helen Oda, with the Nisei Week Foundation, Cold Tofu, East West Players, the restaurants, the shops. I mean, this place is amazing. So what a way to just honor and you know pay tribute to such a beautiful community and a beautiful area of Los Angeles. So if you guys have not been to Little Tokyo in a while, or maybe you've never been to Little Tokyo and you guys are coming to Los Angeles, please visit and uh, take part in all that it has to offer. So to get us started, um, the, little, uh, the Imagine Little Tokyo Short Story Committee was impressed by the number of entries and also their high qualities in the categories of adult English, youth, and Japanese. And while people were socially distanced, they took the time to finally finish, and in some cases, finish the first story that they had ever written. So there's some good stuff that came out of the pandemic, right? And, you know, just to complete a short story is an achievement in and of itself. So we congratulate every person who sent in an entry. Good going, everybody. All right, now let's just get to the main event. To announce the winners and listen to the stories read by award-winning stage actors. Here we go. So first, representing the adult English category judging panel is Susie Ling, Pasadena City College professor. Her comments will be followed by actor Greg Watanabe, who will read this year's winner, If You Can See the Watchtower by Jacob Lowe. Now, in this story, Little Tokyo's Yagura features prominently 
in, a, in this story of a man who is separated from his young daughter during the pandemic. Actor Greg Watanabe is well known in theater circles, uh, having made his broad, Broadway debut in Allegiance and was recently seen in Cambodian rock band at Victory Gardens. I go a long way back with Greg too, having performed with him a couple of times. So Greg is a, a wonderful actor and it's a real treat to have him here today to be reading this uh, for all of us. After the reading, our author, Jacob Lowe, will say a few words and a little bit about Jacob. Jacob earned his master's degree of professional writing from USC and currently lives in Little Tokyo. So with that said, I introduce to you uh, Susie Ling. Take it away, Susie. It's great to be with you today. I'm speaking on behalf of the adult judges. My name is Susie Ling and I teach Asian American Studies at Pasadena City College. The other two judges on our team were Gwen Muranaka, the editor of Rafu Shimpo, and Timothy Toyama, a playwright and co-founder of Cedar Grove on stage. It was a real pleasure to work with them. We read our stories independently and got together virtually to have a thrash out on who would be the winner. Our meeting was extremely short. The winner came out on the top very easily. Congratulations to number 40. At this taping, I'm afraid I don't know who number 40 is, but we really enjoyed your story, Watchtower. One of the judges said that when they first read the story, they were touched. They read it another time and they were more sensitive to the story. And by the third time, this judge was crying. Another judge said that the love between the father and the daughter was so elegantly written that in Watchtower, we were all, all our raw emotions were felt, especially at this time of the quarantine. Um, another judge said that in this story, Little Tokyo and the Watchtower itself were characters in the story. We are all the judges, all very different people, and we each loved other stories for this or other stories for that. But for us, this whole little Tokyo uh, a short story contest was a great success and helped us all feel a little more akin to you and to our community. Thanks. If you can see the watchtower, it's a shame to rush through these streets with its cozy plazas and meandering pathways, its shop windows stocked with colors and flavors, its nooks and crannies inviting you to get lost in them. Little Tokyo is meant to be strolled through. But, of course, these days are for nothing but rushing when it comes to leaving my apartment. Rush downstairs, Avoid the elevator, lest you might share the cramped space with someone. Run to where you're headed for groceries, for provisions. And rush back. Strolling is a luxury from a bygone era. I'm rushing back from the market, rushing home to Zoom with Hitomi. She turns five today and happens to be the daughter whose hand I haven't held for five months and three days, but... Who's counting? She also happens to be the last person I actually strolled through Little Tokyo with. And dashing through the plaza at the Japanese American Cultural and Community Center, I think of the first time here with Hitomi almost two years ago. I had her for the weekend and brought her to Little Tokyo for Nisei week. It was my first time at the festival as well, and the two of us were equally awestruck, I think. Hard to picture it now, but on that day, this plaza was abuzz with activities. The aromas of all the food on offer. A joyous drumbeat echoing from somewhere. People mingling and laughing together, sharing the space. 
We watched a gyoza eating contest and had our picture taken with Kumumon, the larger-than-life bear mascot of the Kumamoto Prefecture, who was surrounded by adoring fans. You always wonder if celebrities will live up to your expectations when you meet them in real life, I joked with Hitomi. But he couldn't have been more gracious with us, a real class act. I like his red cheeks, Hitomi answered. There was a table nearby with posters and brochures promoting Kumamoto, showing the destruction caused by the recent earthquake there, but proclaiming that the region was emerging from the disaster stronger than ever. There was an earthquake here? Hitomi asked. Not here, in Japan, I said. But we feel it here, too. I took her hand, squeezing it twice, as I always do with her, and I could sense her feeling it now, too. Feeling the weight of it, the somberness, sharing this experience with people across the ocean she's never met. She's already someone who is easily moved. I could see in that moment, soaking up the emotions that surround her. She gets that from me. Now he told me he's actually there, across the ocean, living with her mother. Big Tokyo, she calls it, although maybe I'm the one who started her saying it. I brought her here for her birthday last year to get her ready for the move. I'm scurrying past Kuraku, whose 1970s white and Mikon orange sign, Japanese restaurant, with the kanji characters beneath, is one of my favorites, and I remember Hitomi with me stopping at the storefront nearby, gazing at the array of sneakers gleaming like sports cars. That window is boarded up now. There were riots just two weeks ago. I cross the street into the Japanese village plaza, and I'm alone. I find myself going out of my way a bit for the first time in a while. I hesitate to say it, but am I strolling? Past the shops where I spent so much time with Hitomi that day, pouring through racks of comic book colored t-shirts, shelves of plush cartoon characters, display cases of pastries and mochi ice cream. All the places are here, but the people and the music and joy are gone. I walk through to the other end of the plaza, to the watchtower. He told me love to the watchtower. A Yagura, I had explained to her. My family name, he told me surname, happens to be Yagura, and she looked up at the simple red structure with reverence. In Japanese villages, the watchtower was how the village kept safe, I told her. Someone at the tip-top could look out over the village for miles around and make sure everything was okay. If you could see the watchtower, you knew you were safe, because the watchtower could see you. Did I really know what I was talking about? Either way, he told me liked that. I'm a Yagura, she sang. I'm a watchtower, and you're a watchtower. Afterwards, we strolled through the Japanese American National Museum, where I bought her some Japanese alphabet blocks at the gift shop, and to Kinokuniya, one of the Japanese bookstore's few American locations, where I picked her up a children's book on Tokyo with drawings that made it look like a magical place. She was excited for her new home. I ended up coming back here and picking out an apartment with a view of the watchtower. To be closer to work, I could tell anyone if they asked why I came here. Just a quick ride on the metro rail. Is it silly if I tell you the real reason I moved to Little Tokyo was that, somehow, I would feel closer to Hitomi in Big Tokyo? I cross First Street and walk through the plaza by the museum and the Gopher Brook National Education Center, that beautiful ornate building, ancient by Los Angeles standards, which is bedecked with a mural of a dreaming girl captioned by a basho haiku. The silence is striking. I'm thinking of my past here, how sudden the sounds of the festival have given way to nothing, and it occurs to me that little Tokyo has its own past to reflect on that it's been through something like this before. 
How sudden the change must have felt at the outbreak of World War II, when one day crowds of little Tokyo's inhabitants were lined up to be counted at this very building, and then the next day, all those faces, all those voices, they were gone. Down the street, I pass a boarded-up storefront featuring another mural, a freshly painted Impressionist tribute to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and I realize how close I am to the old finale club where Charlie Parker played with Miles Davis. When this was Bronzeville, after Japanese-American residents had been sent away to camps, when Los Angeles's African-American community, having been denied practically everywhere else, found a home here, only to be eventually displaced again. The plan had been for Hitomi to come back here with me for her birthday, but that was in that bygone era when we made such things as plans. What would she say if she were here with me now? What could I possibly tell her as we roamed these deserted streets, these shuttered buildings? What will I tell her? Suddenly, I am as nervous as I am before a meeting with an important client. I've spoken with Hitomi numerous times these past few months, of course avoiding news of the virus, of the unrest. But now it's her birthday, and we're apart, and Japan has entered a state of emergency as well. I can only wonder and worry about how she's feeling now. What do I tell her? That no one in the watchtower could have kept us safe from this? That there is no one in the watchtower? That it's nothing but a replica, a metal model painted to look wooden? I shouldn't dawdle, but I end up circling through to the, the Weller Court past the Friendship Knot. At the market, people are organizing themselves into a spaced-out line, patiently waiting for their temperatures to be checked, waiting to be let inside. Everywhere there are posters with cute cartoon cats he told me would like. The cats are wearing masks and asking you to do the same, to stay home if you are sick, to be considerate of others in the community. I've heard from friends living in other places complaining about neighbors who are not cooperating with health orders, not wearing masks, not giving space. But not here. Incongruously, a sugary burst of cheerful J-pop is spilling out onto the streets from the ramen restaurant across the way. The charm of the restaurant is usually its intimacy, an impossibility these days, and the proprietor and crew are arranging tables on the sidewalk out front, assembling an awning and hanging paper lanterns, making the best of the situation. Every day they have to lug all this stuff out, and then back inside again every night. I hear them whistling along with the J-pop tune. I'm going to be late now, and I cut through a back way behind my building and come around the parking structure. It's something that happens to you in Los Angeles all the time. You turn a corner a different way than you normally do, come from a different angle, and the sun hits you in a certain way, and a street you've gone down a million times looks like you've never seen it before. It happens to me as I turn from the construction site, the future metro rail connector, and see an old mural that's recently been restored, made to look new, and I feel like I'm seeing it for the first time. Home is little Tokyo, it says, and it's populated with colorful smiles, drawings that make little Tokyo look like a magical place. Is there a way for me to tell he told me this, too? This feeling I get from these streets today, that even though everyone's wearing a mask, I know they're smiling at me. That when it comes some time to work together, to trust each other, that's when you know what a community is made of. That where there's a history of suffering, there's also a history of resilience. I run upstairs to my apartment, putting groceries away after wiping the containers, washing my hands, wiping the counters, washing my hands again. 
I have a bookcase behind my desk that I have carefully arranged as my backdrop for my Zoom meetings. I rushed to Kinokuniya recently to restock so I could appear more business-minded, and Haruki Murakami and Banana Yoshimoto made way on my shelf for boring business writers. But already, Mitomi's mother is calling, and I grab the laptop and jump to the sofa instead. I'm reaching back, flipping open the blinds on the window behind me as I answer, hoping not to look like a guy sitting in his room in the dark. Are you ready to have a conversation with Dad? My former wife is saying to Hitomi. Hitomi is excellent at having conversations now, she tells me with a smirk. And then... Hitomi is on screen. Happy birthday, I tell her. I still can't get over the awkwardness of these calls, wondering if I'm actually being heard. Thank you, Dad, she says. Her voice is a bit more formal now, and she's saying Dad instead of Daddy. It makes me want to laugh. Are you doing well? Can you tell me? she asks, sounding rehearsed. I am, I answer, playing along. And you, are you well? She looks off to the side for a moment. I hear her mother in the kitchen. We feel it here too, she says earnestly, now sounding like herself. My little Hitomi. She looks at me then, leans in closer to the camera so that I'm getting an up-close view of her forehead. You're safe. What can I say? I find myself not being able to answer. But then again, she wasn't asking a question. I realize, as she's falling back into her chair now, that she's looking behind me, and I turn around. You can see the watchtower, Hitomi says. I can. Out my window like a lovely wisp of red watercolor that someone's painted with an expert flick of the wrist. It's there. I turn back to her, smiling at me, and her voice is sing-song, as sugary as that J-pop tune I can still hear from the restaurant below. And the watchtower can see you. Wow, thank you so much. That, that was incredible. Uh, thank you for that reading to Greg. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, to the reviewers and uh, Little Tokyo Historical Society, Imagine Little Tokyo Committee, um, everyone involved, Discover Nikkei, Janum, uh, Rafu Shimbo. Um, this is such a cool program. It's such a unique uh, creative way, especially this year for us to you know, uh, share our love for this neighborhood and this, this amazing community. So. I'm so proud just to be included in this program and I'm really grateful for this honor. So thank you so much. This really means a lot to me. Thank you very much. And once again, congratulations, Jacob, on your award-winning short story. And again, um, as in the chat, you will be able to read all of our winners at the discoverenike.org website. So just go ahead and follow that if you guys want to reread or rehear some of these stories that we're presenting today. So great job, Jacob. Congratulations once again. So the lucky and talented winners in each of these categories is awarded a $500 cash prize, which is substantial you know, for a contest like this. This contest, which began as a seed of an idea by Bill Watsonabe, is completely run by volunteers, and it's only funded through donations. So if any of these stories move or entertain you, please consider giving money to the Little Tokyo Historical Society through their website at www.littletokyohs.org. Oh, Mike, sorry, you got muted. Have you turned yourself back on there? <laughs> oh, darn it, okay. I'm not sure where exactly I was unmuted, but that's okay. Um, long story short, uh, please check out littletokyohs.org. Um, you know, if, you, if you're interested in donating towards this organization so that they can continue with programs such as these. Um, and if I was muted earlier, 
Uh, it's all on discovery.org. Uh, I'm sorry, discovery, discoverNike.org. It's in the chats, so it, it's easy to find. Okay, once again, thank you, Jacob. Congratulations. Now on to our next category. So next is our judge in the youth category, Andy Kimura, who works as the education manager at Gopher Broke National Education Center. She'll be, she'll be introducing the winning story in our youth category called A Walk Down Memory Lane, written by Casey Morase, followed by a reading by my own good friend and colleague, Julie Lee. Uh, as mentioned earlier, Julie is the artistic director of Cold Tofu, an organization that she and I have been in since we were, I think, age five now. So we're kind of like going backwards in time. Big joke. Uh, you guys probably don't get it. But nonetheless, Julie is an award-winning actress, uh, recently nominated for an Ovation Award for her work with East West Players and the Fountain Theater called uh, Hannah and the Dread Gazebo. You could also catch Julie in a whole bunch of different TV um, shows and you know, theater uh, presentations all over LA. And again, she's just a, a wonderful actress, a great friend, and she'll be reading um, Casey's uh, story, Walk Down Memory Lane. And afterwards, uh, and actually for Casey herself, Casey is a senior at Eagle Rock High School who will be attending San Diego State in the fall. Go Aztecs and congratulations to you, Casey. So without further ado, let's uh, give it off to Andy. Take it away, Andy. Hi everyone. Um, again, my name is Andy Kimura. I'm the education manager at Go For Broke National Education Center. And I had the privilege of being one of the judges for the youth category, um, along with Lynn Yamasaki, the director of education at the Japanese American National Museum, and Ann Shimojima, uh, who is an author and storyteller and educational speaker. Um, so the three of us um, had a really great time reading all of the entries and um, across the board, uh, like the adult version, there were a lot of things we liked about certain stories here and there, but Casey, um, congratulations. You really captured um, the spirit and the sense of Little Tokyo to us. Um, and a little note about Lynn and Ann and myself, Lynn, Lynn and I both kind of grew up with regular visits to Little Tokyo. Um, and now obviously both work in the neighborhood, but Ann is joined us and I think she's on too, is joining us in um, from the suburbs of Chicago and has only visited Little Tokyo like once or twice. Um, so Casey, your description really of painting Little Tokyo um, was done in such a way that like easily transported Anne um, and made the unfamiliar familiar. So kudos on that. Um, and also congratulations to the Little Tokyo Historical Society for receiving triple the amount of submissions this year um, in this category. I think that's really awesome and amazing um, and just a testament to how much there is to love about Little Tokyo. Uh, it was really wonderful to read all those different facets um, in the various entries. Um, but arguably, at least I think, um, one of the most important responsibilities that we all have um, in continuing the magic of Little Tokyo is sharing the rich history. And this of course includes um, passing down larger historical events, but I think what's equally important is passing down those familial memories and those generational ties. And it, Casey, it was your really intimate exploration of, the, of memory um, that the panel like, was really captivated by. Um, we all enjoyed that you had a really strong sense of community um, and culture and I like this journal sense of welcoming. Um, so again, just congratulations um, on this win as well as graduating and we look forward to all the things that you're going to do in the future. Um, and thanks again to Little Tokyo Historical Society uh, for just creating the space um, to have this annual event um, where people can come together and share their love for Little Tokyo. Thank you. A walk down memory lane. Now, I've always thought that I was in touch with my community and with the people that belong to it. I mean, I went down there every Saturday after Bachan, my grandma picked me up from Japanese school. I even went to Japanese school to indulge myself in Japanese culture. Well, that and my mom and Bachan insisted that I go. 
However, it wasn't until Ba Chan passed away that I truly began to understand the importance of community and appreciate the culture of Little Tokyo. Ba Chan and I were always very close. Every Saturday after Japanese school, she would take me to Little Tokyo and we would walk down First Street to get a box of delicious manju from Fugetsudo and say hello to Ba Chan's friends at the Koban. Every time we walked, Ba Chan would always make me stand on the engraved timeline that goes along First Street and tell the same stories. She would hold the, the locket necklace that she always wore and say, oh, here is where I used to go to church with my family and friends. Oh, and here is where my family used to eat after funeral. Uh, Kimiko, let's go hold the, the locket necklace that she always wore and say, oh, here is where I used to go to church with my family and friends. Oh, and here is where my family used to eat after funeral. Uh, Kimiko, let's go uh, here. This is where I used to always get new shoes when mine got old. And, and right down here is where I watched my first Nisei week parade. Finally, we would arrive at Fugetsudo. And Bachan would again hold her necklace and say, this place, Fugetsudo, is the most special of all the places that I have been. I would ask, well, what happened here, Bachan? Eh, we will save that story for another time. Let's get some manju, she would say. One Saturday, I asked Ba Chan why she always told me the same stories and why we always had to go to Fugetsudo for, for Manju. Ba Chan said, Kimiko, these places are important to me, especially Fugetsudo. Although some of the stores I told you about are no longer here, this timeline reminds me of the growth of my community and how important it is to preserve Japanese American culture. I want to pass my fondest memories of this community down to you so that one day you can pass them down to your children. I don't get it though, Bachan. I was not here with you when the memories happened. So why is it important for me to know? I wasn't even alive then, I said. Bachan smiled and responded, you'll understand when you're older, Kimiko. I know you will. Later, that same month, Bachan passed away. I stopped going to Japanese school for a while. I just missed Bachan too much. And to know that she would not pick me up and walk me down First Street like we always used to would just make me miss her even more. Then one Saturday, my mother insisted that I go back to Japanese school and walk down First Street after. She said that going back to First Street might give me some closure with Bachan's passing. I don't know if I'm ready to go back, I said. Mom walked away into her room and came back, holding Bachan's locket necklace that she wore every time she picked me up from school. Before Bachan passed, she said that she wanted you to have this. She said, she wanted you to wear it the next time you go down to First Street, Little Tokyo. I took the necklace and agreed to go back to Japanese school and walk down First Street again. I started at the Gopher Brook Museum where Bachan used to go to church. I stood on the engraved timeline where she would always make me stand and held her locket just as she did. Then Suddenly, the museum started to change. Confused, I looked up at the historical building and saw that it was no longer go for broke. It was Nishi Hongwanji Buddhist Temple, the church that Ba Chan belonged to. I peered through the window and saw a little girl that vaguely resembled myself walking out of the Hondo, the main hall of the temple, with her family and friends. It's Bachan, I said. When these events initially occurred, I thought that I was going insane, that my grief was taking over me, which was causing me to hallucinate. Then I looked down at Bachan's locket and saw that it was 
glowing yellow. At first, I didn't know what to think of this and wished that I could talk to Bachan to ask her what was happening. I opened the locket to find the source of its glow and found a gem next to a picture of Bachan and myself. On the back, the stone read, you're old enough to understand. It took me a minute to figure out why Bachan would leave this message for me, but I soon recalled the questions that I had asked her not long before her passing. I peered through the window again and saw Bachan bowing to the Rimban, asking, thanking him for the service and the wonderful Dharma message. Doitashimashite, you're welcome. Thank you for listening, the Rimban said with a wide grin. Bachan used to always make me think the Rimban when I went to church too. She said that it shows that we have respect and appreciation for our senseis, teachers, and their teachings. After Bachan bowed to the Rimban again, everyone disappeared, and a few seconds later, Bachan was walking out of the Hondo again. Well, figuring that the memory she showed me must have ended, I continued to walk down First Street to the places that Bachan always told me about. Next was Far East Lounge, where Bachan and her family used to go after a funeral. I approached the restaurant, stepped on the timeline, held Bachan's locket, and peered inside. Just like the Gopher Broke Museum, the inside of Far East Lounge started to change and was suddenly filled with individuals wearing all black. It must be a funeral, I thought to myself. I continued looking through the window to see if I could spot Bachan. Then I overheard a little girl saying, Okasan, mom, can we please get manju after lunch? That was auntie's favorite place and instinctively knew that it was Bachan. She appeared to be around seven years old, smiling and lighting up the room even in the darkest of times. That was always Bachan's gift. And she said that I have it too. I smiled and was about to walk away when Bachan asked, Okasan, why do I have to learn how to use hashi chopsticks? All of my American friends use a fork. Bachan's mom replied, Using hashi is a Japanese custom and an important part of Japanese culture. I learned to use them when I was around your age, and now it's your turn. As the memory ended, I was reminded that Bachan had made me learn to use Hashi when I was about seven as well. She said that learning to use Hashi at a young age is a family tradition and that traditions transmit the values and stories that have been passed down from generations. I didn't understand Bachan at the time, but started to after watching her memory. After Far East Lounge, I went to My Ramen Bar, formerly known as Asahi Shoe Store where Bachan used to get her brand new white shoes. Again, I stood on the timeline and held Bachan's locket as I peered through the window to see if I could see Bachan. I spotted her in the back, trying on a brand new pair of shoes. She looked to be around 13 and was approached by a worker who asked her how she liked the shoes. They fit nicely, thank you, Bachan said. Okay, great. Remember to break them in before you go running around with your friends and always take them off before entering your house, the worker said with a smile. Take them off before I enter my house. Why would I do that? It is a Japanese custom to always take your shoes off before entering your home so your floor does not get dirty. Bachan and mom always made me take off my shoes before entering the house too. But I never knew it was a Japanese custom before watching Bachan's memory. After the shoe store, I made my way down to where Bachan saw her first Nisei Week Parade, which she described as a festival that celebrates Japanese American culture and history. I approached the timeline once again, held Bachan's locket, and watched First Street Little Tokyo transform from a generic winter day to a crowded and celebratory summer environment. Odori music was playing. People were performing on their taiko, and I could hear fresh shave ice being made further down the street. I looked around for Bachan and spotted her coming out of the Asahi shoe store with her friends. 
she stood right next to me, admiring the, the uh, Odori dancers. Why don't you join in? I said with a smile. Bachan looked at me as if I were an old friend. She smiled and winked, then ran into the street with her friends to join the Odori dancers. Bachan looked very happy, even though she was dancing incorrectly. Not long after, the Bachan, Bachan and her friends were approached by an Odori instructor who taught them how to properly dance the moves. Within minutes, Bachan looked like a professional and still had the widest smile on her face. I thought her memory would end there and was about to visit Fugetsudo when I heard Bachan say, Hey, come and join. I looked around in confusion to see who she was talking to and realized that she was looking at me. She ran over, took my hand, and brought me into the circle. I had never Odori danced before either, so Bachan was showing me all the moves as if she were the Odori instructor. After the song ended, I thanked Bachan for letting me dance with her and her friends and complimented her Odori dancing. Don't thank me. It's always my pleasure to pass down and share traditions with my community. That is what connects us, Bachan said. I smiled and was about to cry. I wanted to tell Bachan who I was. I wanted to give her the biggest hug and ask her to walk down First Street with me one last time. Come on, Hannah, you're missing the dance, Bachan's friends called out to her. She looked at me and put her hand on her necklace, just like she used to do when she was alive. Then she ran back into the crowd with her friends to do more odori dancing. Soon after, Bachan's memory faded and it was a cool winter day again. I found myself back on present day First Street in front of Fugetsudo, Bachan's last memory. I stood on the timeline and held her locket up to my chest, filled with anxiousness and excitement to finally understand why Bachan loved this mochi shop so much. Bachan's memory began and I peered in the window to look for Bachan. There she is, I said with glee. Bachan was in front of the display case, smiling and looking at the daifuku, which is her favorite manju. To daifuku, please, said a boy who looked to be around Bachan's age. Lucky you, you got the last two, the worker said. Suddenly, I saw Bachan's smile fade, and she walked out of Fugetsudo with no manju. Wait, said the boy. Obachan turned around, wondering what the boy who took her manju could possibly want now. Here you go. I didn't know you liked Daifuku too, the boy said as he handed Bachan one of his manju. Are you sure? Bachan said as her face lit up with joy. Of course. What kind of person would I be if I did not share with my community? The boy said with a smile. Bachan bowed and said, Arigato. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm Tadashi, by the way. The boy's name sounded very familiar, and I tried to recall where I've heard of him before. Then I remembered that Tadashi was the name of my Jichan, Grandpa, Bachan's husband. He died before I was born, and Bachan never told me much about him because it would always make her sad. I watched Bachan and Jichan talk outside of Fugetsudo and smile over their shared liking of Daifuku. Then Bachan's memory faded and the glow inside of her locket had dimmed. I don't remember much more of that day, except for the answers to the questions that I had asked Bachan before she passed. Why was Fugetsudo the most special place to her? And why was it important for her to always tell me the same stories when we walked down First Street? Fogetsudo was her favorite place because not only did it have delicious manju, but it was also the place where she met the love of her life, her future husband in my Jichan. It was important for Bachan to tell me the same stories of Little Tokyo because she wanted to share her fondest memories of the community with me. 
She wanted to show me where she learned to thank her senseis to show appreciation, where she learned to use hashi, where she learned that it is a Japanese custom to take off your shoes before entering the house. And she wanted to show me where she learned how to odori dance. Most importantly, Bachan wanted to show me the value of my community and the significance of passing down traditions and memories from generation to generation. The lessons and customs that I have learned from Bachan connect me to Little Tokyo and Japanese Americans around the world. Someday, I hope to share my fondest memories of this community with my grandchildren. I hope to give one of them Bachan's locket to show them the value of Little Tokyo and encourage them to appreciate the amazing culture the community has to offer. I hope that they will take the lessons that Bachan has taught me and continue to pass them on to their children and grandchildren so that the values of the Little Tokyo community will live on forever. Thank you so much to everyone um, who read my story, who judged my story, and um, for everyone who listened to my story. Um, a special shout out to my family who helped me um, write this story by sharing their experiences of Little Tokyo and also for um, passing down traditions to me that I hope to pass down to my children. So thank you, everyone. And thank you once again to Andy and the rest of the panelists in this youth category division, to our uh, esteemed colleague, Julie. And of course, thank you and congratulations to you, Casey. Th this story was very heartfelt. I mean, listening to it for the second time or actually reading it for the second time still brings tears to my eyes. So very well done, congratulations. All right. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, um, I now would like to introduce to you Makiko Nakasone, founding member of the Little Tokyo Rotary Club, who will talk about the judges' selection in the Japanese language category entitled Little Tokyo Saisei no Machi, written by Shore and read by actor Eiji Inoue. In this story, we will travel to the future in the 22nd century, where global warming has left Little Tokyo as the only place to experience old Japan. Actor Eiji uh, Inoue has been in 60 plays since making his home here in Los Angeles from Nagoya in Japan. Most recently, he was seen in AMC's The Terror Infamy. Our author, Shore, who resides in Japan, could not be with us for the program today, but committee member Shige Higashi will read the acceptance speech in Japanese, and I will provide the English translation afterwards. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you once again, Makiko Nakasone. Konnichiwa, Little Tokyo Rotary Club, Sosets Kaito, de Moto Nihon Keza Shinbun, Kisha no Nakasone Makiko des. Sinsain to Ste, Sakunen Doyo, Los Angeles, Soriozi Fujin de Netsretna Dokshoka de Aru, Muto Misako san, Pro no Hensu Shade, Yadona Shikobun, Steve Jobs no Zenso no Chosha, Yanagida Yukiko san to Takshi no san in de. 厳正なる審査を行いました。今年は日本語のサイト、Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Makiko Nakasone, Charter President of the Rotary Club of Little Tokyo and former staff writer of the world's largest financial newspaper, Nikkei. As was the case last year, the judges included Mrs. Misako Muto, the wife of the Japanese Consul General in Los Angeles, Mr. Akira Muto, who is an avid reader. Mrs. Yukiko Yanagida McCarty, who is a professional editor and the author of the book on Kobun, the Buddhist monk, 
Apple co-founder Stephen Jobs admired and myself. We reviewed and judged carefully the 27 short stories in Japanese. For the first time, we placed an ad on the Japanese site called Kobo Gaido and received the largest entries ever. The vocabulary and the descriptive skills in most of the entries were much better in quality than last year. On the other hand, many lacked the knowledge of Little Tokyo or the Japanese American culture. Also, some of the stories in the final surpassed the word count limit again this year. We hope the guideline would be written clearer on this next year as we count the blank spaces which have meanings in the Japanese writing. Sate, Sayu Shushu ni Kagayaita, Little Tokyo, Saise no Machi desu na, Ogo Sakhi no Uchi, Yuiz, Jidai Haike wo, Nishu ni Seki to you, Mirai ni Sete, LGBTQ no Shujinko, Oreto, Little Tokyo no Mesho, Koba ni Kimbu Sur. AI Tokyo so she AI ni kokyo wo ubaware ta to suru kage no aru seinen shimura to yu 3 nin no tojo jinbutsu no shinjou ya katto seichou wo egaita tanpen desu the winner of the short story in the japanese is little tokyo town of revitalization the story takes place in little tokyo in the 22nd century it is a story of three main characters me who is an LGBTQ, Tokyo, who is an AI working at the Koban, and Shimura, who believes his hometown was taken over by AI. Their feelings toward each other, conflicts, and their growth are written with thoughtfulness and mixture of great conversations and descriptions. Gendai shakai ga chokumen suru AI ya LGBTQ no mondai wo takumi ni douniu shi, Seikyo we want to applaud the writer's creativity for introducing the much talked about AI and LGBTQ issues in this story, depicting Little Tokyo from a unique angle, which has experienced prosperity, decline, and revitalization. We appreciated the ending, which gives the readers hope for future. Big congratulations. Little Tokyo, Saisei no Machi. 22世紀 Little Tokyo. Maichiru Konayuki o miyage, ore wa koto no eri o tate, liyo te ni iki o fuki kake ta. 1世紀 mai nara kono machi de konna yuki ga furukota wa nakatta to, itz datta ka Tokyo ga ore ni oshiete kureta. Tokyo ta o kouban kimu no AI da. Kono machi ga AI to no kyozon o kimete kara, Tokyo wa zutto kono machi no chihan o mamaru tame, ささいな犯罪にも目を光らせてきたらしい。人間の年齢にしたら記事をとっくに迎えているはずだが、時代の外見は20代後半の俺と変わらなかった。それだけ人間の能力が AIに劣るのかと聞かれたら、俺の人間としてのプライドが認めないだろうけど、人間には人間の良さがあると、俺は今でも信じている。地球環境を破壊し、人類始まって以来互いに殺戮という過ちを繰
昔この町でじいさんのじいさんつまり高祖父が苦労しながらもこの土地で再生を果たしたと聞いていたからだ高祖父の祖父は第二次世界大戦後この町に移住してきた日系人の一人だ愛してやまない日本がアメリカとの戦争に踏み切った時彼も祖国を見かけることにしたのだというその選択は正しかったのだと思う戦後日本は泥水を吸っての,のし上がったにもかかわらずその後次第に世界から遅れを取り出した日本人としての意地とか誇りとか俺たち若者はとっくにどこかに置き去りにしてしまっていた事件が起きたのは俺はこの町の生活に少しずつ慣れてきた3月だった交番勤務の時代が何者かに打たれたとの通知がスマホに届いたこの通知は PSCR というアプリ登録者に自動的に届くものだ町の治安は住民たちで守ろうという目的で町で起こった事件について通知されることになっている「時代大丈夫か?」交番に駆けつけた俺の顔を見て時代は微笑んだ AI とは思えない自然で綺麗な笑顔その笑顔を見て負った傷が深刻でないことを知る打たれたのが私でよかったほっとしていると涼しい時代の顔時代の声が返ってきた何言ってるんだよいいわけないだろうここに渡ってきたばかりの頃右も左もわからなかった俺に誰よりも親切に接してくれた時をその時を失うなど俺は考えたくもなかった AI には感情がないという科学者もいるが人間と同じで生活環境の中で身についていくものではないだろうか犯人はもう特定できてるんだろうはい時代にしてはすっきりしない返答だったなんだよ時代そいつは犯人をかばってるのさ現れ,たの現れたのは自治会長の大杉さんだった生まれた時からこの町で暮らしている彼は現在70歳そう実は時代と同世代だ大杉さんにも犯人の見当がついてるんですか新参者のあいつだろう新参者その言葉は耳に痛かった俺も半年前にはそうささやかれていたのだろう大杉さんが新参者と呼んだその男志村がこの町へやってきたのは確か夏の終わりだった年齢より幾分老けて見えるが俺より一つ二つ上だと聞いていた日中の日差しに焼き尽くされた肌が夜の涼しい外気によって適度に冷やされる季節の変わり目に彼は長袖の夜景を身につけていた生まれ変わるための新天地を求めてきたにしては誰とも交わらず溶け込むこともしない人だと思っていたあの男は犯罪者じゃないかってさ犯罪って何をしでか,してかしたんだよ言われてみればいつもどこがコソコソしてるよな志村の態度は逆に人々の噂を呼んだお前も気をつけろ気をつけろって何だよ俺は問うただ町の雰囲気に馴染めないだけかもしれない人間を疑うのはどうかと思う俺も所詮はよそ者だからそんな感情が生まれるのだろうか時代はあの人のことどう思う本当にみんなが噂するような悪人なのかなあなたはどう感じているのです時代に聞き返されて俺は答えに窮するわからないから聞いてるんじゃないか本当に受け継ぐ者と時代は俺たちをそう呼んだ家計であれ会社であれ長く続いていくものにはそれを継いで伝えて伝えていくものが必要になる時代は俺たちが人としてこの町を受け継いでいくのだと説明してくれた時代はまた受け継ぐものに必要な3つの目についても語っていたいち早く未来を予期するための先見の目力を持つ者に,者にこそ必要な控え目そして相手を内面的に判断できる心の目だだけど心の目なんて凡人の俺に備わるものなのか人を外見で判断しては何も解決しません時代の言葉に大杉さんは鼻から息を吐き出す俺に説教するってかいいえそんなつもりはありません
やつがやったことに違いはないんだだったらさっさと捕まえて白状させちまえどこか短気なところのある大杉さんは時代に向かって怒鳴ったどんな相手にも耳を傾けるべきです互いに分かり合うためにも AI のくせしやがってどこまで甘いんだ吐き捨てるようにして大杉さんがその場を去ると時代は残った俺に神戸を巡らすあなたも彼と同じ考えですかどのあたりが捕まえて自白させれば済むことでしょうか多分それでは根本的な解決にはならないことを大杉さんだって分かっているのだだけど俺たち人間は罪を犯した人との会話を長い間避けてきた大杉さんが AI の時を罵るのは自分たち人間への苛立ちからなのではないだろうかと俺なりに解釈するだけどあの人が話を聞くかなやりもしないうちからためらうのも俺の悪いところだ彼と話ができるのはあなたしかいませんなんでだよよそ者だからです時代の感情のないはずの瞳に光が宿る彼が意味することを受け止め俺は知らず知らずのうちにうなずいていた21世紀に繰り返し起こった大地震と大津波そして竜巻などによる自然災害で揺らぎ始めた大国アメリカいくつかの天災を耐え抜いたこの町も海岸線にぐっと近づいたのだという知識はすべて時代からの受け売りだ俺は志村を探して遠く水平線を一望できるこの海岸までやってきたそして時代の予想通り彼は堤防に突っ立ってタバコを吸っていた「志村さんあなたに話があるんだけどようやく捕まえに来たか」声をかけると慌てた様子もなく横目で伺ってくる。それは時代の仕事だから。あんな AI に町のすべてを掌握されて、お前たちは悔しくないのか。悔しい。志村は聞き返す俺の顔をじっと見据えた。俺の故郷も昔は漁業で発展していた。だけどある時から AI にすべてを任せることになってしまった。俺も。海底に沈んでしまえって思ってたんだ自分自身も町も国もこの地球全部意外そうな顔をする志村は俺志村に俺は苦笑して続けるあなただけじゃないよ志村さん過去や秘密を抱かれてこの町に逃げ場を求めてきたのはお前一体地球,地球が強制的にリセットしたのと同じように俺たち人間もそれが必要な,んだなのだと思うことを志村に伝えた人間はリセットしたくてもなかなかうまくいかないけどお前がリセットしたいことって何なんだ志村は俺の頼りない心を見透かそうとするかのように両面を細めるいよいよ自分の秘密を他人に打ち明ける時が来たのだ性的マイノリティって言葉は知ってるああ随分昔に騒がれてたよなそう聞き返して志村は何かを悟ったように目を丸くしたお前俺は女子としてこの世界に生を受けただけど与えられた体になじめず女の子っぽい外見も嫌いだったそれなのに好きになるのはやはり男の子でそれが余計に俺を悩ませたそれで一時期 LGBT が世間でも注目されるようになった時チャンスだと思ってさ俺はそこまで説明してからわざとらしく肩をすくめてみせるカミングアウトってやつをしたんだでも俺が,み俺がいた町ではまだまだそういうのが認められてなくて知り合いや同僚の冷たい視線に自分は異常だと責められて,責められているようでいたたまれなくなったこの町へ逃げてきたのかそういうこと俺のご先祖様が第二次世界大戦の後このリトル東京で再生を果たしたって知ってさいつかご先祖様のように見事に復活してみたいと思ったのだそして自分を認めてくれなかった人たちを見返してやりたかったこれで志村さんだけじゃないって
分かったでしょう。故郷を捨てて逃げてきたのは、俺の話を聞き終えた志村は真面目な顔つきでうなずいた。だけど今度逃げたら完全に負けだと思ってる。一度はいいけど、同じ問題から二度は逃げちゃいけない。これ、誰が教えてくれたか知ってる志村はそこで首を振る。時代だよ。あなたが嫌ってる AI だ。俺も初めは AI に人間のような感情があるとは思わなかったけど、違ったのか。彼らの方が学び始めたら、人間よりたくさんの感情を持つかもしれない。この町へ来てから時代の温かい笑顔にどれだけ俺は救われたことだろう。私もこの町もあなたを受け入れます。だからきっと。再生を果たしてください。人々の視線に怯えていた俺に時代はそう言って励ましてくれた「志村さんあなたももう逃げないで」俺の気持ちが伝わったのかわからないけど志村の顔に浮かぶ微笑を俺はその時初めて見たのだ志村が町を出て行ったと知ったのは数日後やはり時代からだった。あいつやっぱり逃げやがった大杉さんのぼやきに時代は何も言わなかったが二人きりになった交番で俺は彼から聞かされた志村さんはけがを負わせたことを私に謝ってくれましたあなたと話をしたとも言っていました町を出るのはあなたの話に納得しなかったからではないとも一度故郷へ帰ってやり,残したやり残してきたことにけじめをつけたいそうですそして次にこの町へ戻った時は逃げないとあなたに伝えてほしいと言っていましたレル東京何度も再生を果たした町だけどそれは人の力がなしたことだ年齢も性別も人種も超えてきっと俺もこの町で新しい自分に再生してみせる Hello.、Uh, can I read、uh, the message? Yes, go ahead. Okay.、Uh, my name is uh, uh, Shige Higashi.、Uh, I'm helping the,、uh, this、uh, Little Tokyo、uh, short story contest、uh, for several years. And、uh, I'm, uh, I will read uh, the uh, Japanese message、uh, from the、uh, winner.、Uh, 皆さんはじめまして、えー、奨励です、えー。この度は、リトル東京歴史協会第8回イマジン・リトル東京ショートストーリーコンテストにおいて、私の作品、リトル東京再生の町を最優秀作品に選出していただいたこと、えー、大変ありがたく光栄に思っております。本日の授賞式には個人の都合で出席することができませんが携わられた皆様には心より御礼申し上げます。現在地球上の人たちがコロナウイルスに悩まされ日々多くの犠牲者が出ている状況です。憎むべきはコロナウイルスのはずなのに。一部の心ない人たちの怒りの矛先がアジア人に向けられていると知り、とても悲しく残念に感じます。私が今回の作品を書き始めた時も、すでにコロナが蔓延していました。町はロックダウンやステイホームなどで閑散とし、人と人の触れ合う
時間が大幅に削減されてしまいましたですから物語の中では逆に一種であるお互いを認め合い新しいものを拒まない人たちを作り上げていく世界を描いてみたいと思ったのです現実の世界でも私たち人間が互いに思いやり理解を示したら素敵な未来が待っているのではないでしょうかロサンゼルスのリトル東京は私には未知の街でありますがこれを機会にいろいろとネット検索をするようになりましたそしてコロナが落ち着いたらぜひ訪れてみたい世界の街の一つになりましたこの街この夢も実現するよう願っています最後になりますが当日まで最優秀賞に選ばれたことは誰にも言わないようにとご連絡くださった三田様から釘を刺されていましたですからこのスピーチを代理の方が皆様に読んでくださっている今頃は今回の賞のことを家族や友達に私は自慢しまくっていることでしょう日本は早朝5時を過ぎたばかりですが改めて皆様に感謝をお伝えし、えー、奨励のスピーチに変えさせていただきます全世界の人たちに幸せが訪れますようにありがとうございました This is end of Japanese original message Thank you, Shige san. And now I'll be reading、uh, Shore's acceptance message in English. Hello, everybody. My name is Shore. It is my great honor to receive the Japanese section's first prize in the eighth Imagine Little Tokyo short story contest for my work, Little Tokyo City of Regeneration. I regret that I am not able to join this ceremony for personal reasons, but I'd like to express my gratitude from the bottom of my heart to those involved in this short story contest. All of us are suffering the global COVID 19 pandemic and witnessing many casualties from the disease every day. I feel sadness and injustice when I hear that US Asians are being targeted by some inconsiderate persons who misunderstand that Asians brought COVID 19 to the US. We should blame the COVID 19 and not Asians. When I started to write this work, COVID 19 had already spread to my city. Streets were empty because of the government's lockdown order. We were forced to reduce time for meeting people in person. This situation in the real world motivated me to write a story that people are open to accept different beings and to depict a future world created by those who do not reject new things. In the real world, I believe we can create a good future by caring and understanding each other. In spite of never being in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles, I gained a lot of knowledge about Little Tokyo by searching on the internet, and I became attracted to Little Tokyo, and I wish to visit Little Tokyo as soon as the COVID 19 pandemic is over. I was asked not to spread the announcement of my winning the short story contest until the lifting of the embargo at this moment. It is 5 a.m. in Japan, and I'm starting to call my family and friends about my recognition. I'd like to express my gratitude to all of you again. And conclude my message. May all people in the world live happily. Thank you very much. Thank you once again to Makiko and all the judges in this category, to our actor, reader, Eiji Inoue Shige san, and of course, congratulations to Shore. What a wonderful story. And again, ladies and gentlemen, all of the stories from today's、uh, broadcast will be available on the discovernike.org site for you guys to reread and share with others. So definitely please visit the site. Uh, to, to read the stories and get to know, you know、um, more about these wonderful organizations and these events. Okay, wow, we are practically done. And、um, as mentioned, this has been an unprecedented year for this contest.、Uh, like I said earlier, there had been 99 entrants, which is, I guess, three times、uh, the number of entries that the、um, LTA,、uh, Little Tokyo Historical Society, has received. 
Uh, so with that being said, there were so many of these excellent stories that the judges decided to name a record number of honorable mentions, which I will do here. So our honorable mentions in the English adult category are Chiharu Cohen for Race Queen of Little Tokyo, Emily Beck Cogburn for The Throw, Kendra Arimoto for Little Tokyo AC, and Sophia Ichida Sweet for Mochi Wishes. And in our youth category, Elise Chang for The Creatures of Little Tokyo. Congratulations also to our honorable mention authors. Very well done, everybody. And to everybody who submitted to this year's eighth annual Imaginal Tokyo uh, Short Story Writing Contest. Way to go. Um, once again, as I mentioned, if any of these titles intrigue you, again, you're in luck because all of um, our winners, as well as these honorable mentions, will be uh, published in, to Discover Nikkei. So just basically go over to the discovernikkei.org site and you'll be able to read all of our entrants and our winners there. Um, and, and just, you know, get a, get a taste for everybody's writing and, and all the wonderful stuff that they had written over uh, this, again, very uh, unimaginable year and time. And also, once again, if any of these stories have moved you or entertained you and you guys would like to learn more about uh, Little Tokyo Historical Society, please visit their site at littletokyohs.org. And should you be inclined to donate, there's a purple donate tab there for you guys to do so. And it would be greatly appreciated as events like this are completely run by donations. So we thank you in advance for just taking a look and perhaps even donating to this wonderful event and to these wonderful organizations. All right, so perhaps um, you guys are wondering what's next for the Historical Society? Well, here's a brief preview by one of our members, Jeffrey Chin. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Jichin. I am a board member of the Little Tokyo Historical Society. Congratulations to all the participants and winners of our short story program today. We're very excited for an upcoming publication, A Rebel's Outcry, Biography on Seifuji. Seifuji is an unsung civil rights hero, and we are excited to share his story with the world. Seifuji immigrated to the United States in 1903, and he lived here till 1954. And in his life, he had made many accomplishments, including helping build farmers unions, a hospital in response to this, the influenza epidemic turn of the century. He also founded the Kashi Mainichi newspaper and ran a radio program to promote the lives of the Nisei, the second generation Japanese Americans. In the years leading up to World War II, he also participated in a race relations commission right alongside uh, renowned and respected black attorney Hugh Macbeth. After Seifuji had returned from internment, he also united with former law school classmate J. Marion Wright, and together they overturned the California Alien Land Law, which had historically prevented Asian immigrants from owning land in California. So this win essentially allowed our communities to finally establish our roots in California. So this book, it's 10 years in the making, originally written by Kenichi Sato in Japanese, and he was actually a former employee of the Kashi Mainichi newspaper. The book was translated by Saeko Hika Dickinson and edited by acclaimed author Naomi Hirahara with original artwork by Takashi Uchida. It was also co-published by Fumiko Kero Fujita. This book is not just a history book, but it shows the community a story of our pioneers that contributed to the civil rights that we benefit from today, and a roadmap of how we can build on that very same legacy. So we're officially launching in August. So please stay tuned and follow us on social media. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for that wonderful video about what's happening next. So that about does it, ladies and gentlemen. We would just like to thank all of you for coming and watching our broadcast of the eighth annual Imaginal Tokyo Short Story Contest. We hope you enjoyed the stories and you know, all of the information that we've presented to you guys here today. 
And we'd like to just give a couple of uh, special thank yous to a couple of people. A special thank you for our writing contest donors who made this contest and monetary awards a reality. Without you, this could not happen. And also, for those of you watching today, you guys could also be a part of this as well. Please go visit the little tokyohs.org site and perhaps donate and be a part of this Imagine Little Tokyo family. Um, as for uh, Jacob Lowe's story, that will be on Discover Nikkei's site tomorrow, May 24th. And all of these readings will also be available on the Discover Nikkei site. And please tell all your friends and family to check it out on that website. Uh, as for me, on behalf of myself, I'd like to thank uh, Little Tokyo Historical Society for having me. And congratulations to everybody who submitted their stories this year, as well as to all of our winners in each of the categories. Wonderful job, guys. Bravo to you all. And we hope to see you all next year in person and, of course, uh, virtually as well. Uh, and until that happens, everybody, please stay safe. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And we will see you sooner than later. Bye-bye.